Hello, I'm Tom Groenfeldt. I'm a contributor to Forbes specializing in finance, financial technology. I've written for a variety of publications from American Banker to Alpha Magazine and Banking Technology in London. And I'm here today talking to Ken Harvey. Ken, would you explain some of your de distinguished background? Sure. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I'm a uh, lifelong programmer. Uh, wrote my first line of code in assembler in the late 1970s, so that'll kind of carbon date me. Uh, I've spent my entire career in banking technology, uh, largely working for the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank uh, until about uh, nine years ago. I, I retired and I am now chairman of CLS. Uh, CLS is the largest, uh, at least by economic volume, uh, DFMU, which is a financial market utility, uh, clearing uh, the bulk of the world's uh, foreign exchange trade. How much does that work, work out to a day? <laughs> well, on a busy day, it can be $13 trillion. Um, so foreign, expe foreign exchange is the deepest of the asset classes. So if you think of equities uh, you know, as an asset class or fixed income, more foreign exchange will trade in a given day than any other asset class. So it, it definitely, uh, it weighs heavy on you when you think about things like resilience and security. Ken, which types of data are the most valuable that banks hold, and do they really know what to do with it? I've seen stats that banks only know about 5% 5 5 of the data that they have, and the rest just is kind of wasted. Is that true? Historically, I think financial institutions in general, and banks in specific, have been the largest repositories, if you will, of customer data, and probably the greatest opportunity to create a form of, if you will, digital intimacy uh, with your customers. So if you think about your current account or your checking account, if you will, and the payments you make, your income, uh, if you combine that with your charge cards, where you spend your money, uh, do you travel, tremendous amount of, if you will, formatted customer data and historically the largest repository. Also the most underutilized and under leveraged uh, in terms of customer service or customer intimacy. Um, the real inroads in banks in the last 15, 20 years around customer data have been around security and privacy. So I think banks have done a fantastic job, for instance, monitoring your credit card transactions to make sure that if someone buys something out of pattern, um, that they catch bad guys. So they're very, very good in terms of security and privacy in terms of data and historically weak in, in terms of exploiting data for customer intimacy or customer service that's changing. Uh, and again, their edges, they have the largest historic repository and they have the trust and they have the security. Um, now you need the engineers to help you do something with it that really brings higher value to your customer. But often the banks aren't, don't have the credit card information, right? I think the former uh, CEO of American Express said banks really lost a lot of their insight when they let the uh, credit card companies spin off. And lost the detailed credit card transactions. So now they can see that I've sent it to Amex, but they can't see what I spent it on. Definitely true. I mean, they've retained the current accounts, right? In, in general, current accounts haven't left the banks, but you have standalone, very, very large um, credit card companies. You know, I won't name them, but some of them are very, very good with data and invest quite heavily with data. Uh, and some of those model lines have tried to expand, if you will, backwards or upstream into the current accounts. But the, the bank's primary position is the trusted repository of data, I think, still exists. And that customer trust is going to be more and more important uh, going forward in terms of data protection, data privacy. What are banks, especially banks that operate internationally, like HSBC, what are they doing in following government regulations? Are they changing for each country that they're in, or do they apply the most stringent regulations across the, the globe? In general, I, I think most banks, and specifically international banks, would have to go to the most stringent, um, if you not really will common denominator, but you'll take the most extreme and you'll manage to that. Um, and that's really what you have to do to protect the international payment system. But that's even true of domestic banks. Uh, Again, you've got this trust of the customer and very, very few of the data breaches um, and very, very few of the, of the customer uh, hacks that have caused real damage have gone directly against uh, the banking community. In other words, they've, they've protected themselves well. A lot of your compromises have taken place out in the fringe in retailers 
um, in wholesalers, uh, not in the banks themselves. So where do you see the thi- cyber threats coming? Are they going after the money? Are they going after customer information? Or are they just working in from the edges, as you said? You know, they, they, you'll probably see, I think there's three or four thematics um, that are really going to affect technology over the next three or four years. The exponential growth in bad guys is one of them. Uh, and and there's, there's nation state style that are simply trying to cause disruption. Uh, there's ransom, which you, you've obviously seen very recently, including hitting, you know, uh, gas pipelines, if you will, in the United States. Um, and then there's the actual longest term or original sin, which was trying to extort uh, money or somehow divert money. Um, that exponential rise in bad guys has caused an exponential rise in the investment for financial firms in protecting them. And staying one step ahead of them is incredibly important. Um, actually, I think this is where big data and artificial intelligence kind of overlap and steer the future. In order to keep up with this rising attack pattern, rather it's for pure disruption in the case of nation state or in, in terms of trying to steal something, uh, you really have to start doing pattern recognition on behalf of your customers, just watching transaction flows on behalf of their upstream uh, partners, rather that be retailers or banks. And as soon as you detect something outside the norm, uh, you need to kind of swoop in and shut it down. So I actually think the intersection of big data and AI for the financial community in the beginning will largely be focused on battling the bad guys. Do you see any possibility of improved criminal standards and enforcement across particularly Eastern Europe that w- might stop some of these attacks from, from coming uh, to Western Europe and the U.S.? I wouldn't bank on it, um, you know, because it's, it's, it's not just a few countries. It's, it's any country that um, would benefit from some form of disruption. I do think you're, you'll find increasing regulation around the world that will make it more difficult for them to extract value uh, from things like ransomware. And this is where you, you start falling over into the cryptocurrency space. But the, you know, the people who do these attacks are trying to extort value. And to the extent that value uh, remains transmitted in a way that's trackable, um, that the authorities can oversee, I, I think that's what you have to do is you have to cut off the gain. And I think you'll see traction there on the international front. But what I do I believe law enforcement globally will repel the number of attacks? I do not. I think they will escalate. So what, what's the answer to that? Is there an answer to that? Just more, more artificial intelligence? Well, and I wouldn't say more makes it sound like we have, you know, heaps and heaps and scads of it. I, I think using the credit card industry as, as the best example, because it's 15 year old uh, technology, watching your individual transaction pattern has been in place for, for many, many years. Um, my company was one of the alpha developers of that, of that technology. And we really did cut down a lot of fraud uh, worldwide using that technology. And HSBC is in a lot of places. So it was, a, it was a very, it's a great test tube in which, and to fight fraud. Watching those customer patterns, you know, a guy like yourself, if you never buy gasoline with your credit card and you suddenly buy gasoline, even though it's only a 20 or $25 transactions, we would catch that. We would say, wait, this is way out of pattern for this guy. Maybe we want to stop or verify the transaction. And that's gone light years in terms of cutting down the surface of attack. Now, that example I gave you is all around formatted data. All credit card transactions come in formatted exactly the same way. Every credit card is 16 digits long. You know exactly what pattern to build around Tom, and therefore, you know when Tom stands outside his pattern. Where artificial intelligence comes in, because I wouldn't necessarily call that artificial intelligence, I would call it pattern recognition. I think we called it artificial intelligence in the 1990s, but it, it, it's not really artificial intelligence. A bigger definition right now would be going over unformatted data. And, and this would be particularly mindful in, um, in, in, in know your customer. Uh, so being able to really go out over large amounts of unformatted data be able to build customer profiles to understand your customer better before you board them so you don't allow the bad guys, if you will, uh, into the system. Anti-money laundering is a perfect example where right now you have humans going through scads and scads of what look to be uh, suspicious transactions. And and you're relying on hundreds and hundreds of humans to touch those 
and execute well over a period of time. And as, as we recently found with, with the pandemic, I mean, relying on those humans, even if you put up a, a couple of different centers in a couple of different countries on the other side of the planet, in other words, to do like a follow the sun type structure, you were still disrupted and you still had trouble keeping up. This is where artificial intelligence comes in. And this is where writing algorithms that can look over large amounts of unformatted data to weed out uh, the good guys from the bad guys and not create a lot of um, false positives, we will not, not interrupt a lot of regular transaction flow in terms of trying to catch the bad guys. This is, I think, the biggest area of investment uh, going forward. There's a number of companies in this space. I've worked quite closely with one called Quantiverse that has done a great job in terms of reducing the number of false positives and catching bad guys that would otherwise get through this large human fabric. One other factor I'd like to throw in there is if you compare technology and people now to what they were 20 years ago, 20 years ago, hardware was expensive and people were cheap. And you could even outsource and, and right source your staffing to make people even cheaper. So you could go at things with hundreds and hundreds of bodies. Um, that's inverted. Hardware is now cheap and people are now expensive. And, and therefore, you, you almost have this, uh, you know, the use case for artificial intelligence is simply that. You have this inversion that hardware is now cheap and people are expensive. And therefore, you can actually do a better job at a lower cost point if you marry big data and artificial intelligence. Is all hardware cheap or is the legacy hardware and the big banks holding them back? <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 there, I've seen some statistics that now 50% of all the world's data in, is in the cloud and there's a couple of big credit card companies. Uh, I think Cap One is probably uh, the most notable who've said they now have closed all of their data centers and 100% of it's in the cloud. I, I'm actually not that bothered. Uh, the cost of running an in-house data center if you have scale is, is not that frightening. And there are additional elements of security you can buy yourself by running an in-house center. Um, I think hybrid cloud, you know, uh, if you will, private clouds, uh, another great area for investment and expansion. A lot of big players in that space, and you know all the names. I also think the public cloud will continue to mature, and I think the public cloud will get safer and safer and safer. It's led by three very large, powerful tech firms that invest a lot in security. I think they'll be able to invest in, in pattern recognition, pattern management on behalf of their clients to make sure they don't let bad guys into the mix. Um, so I actually don't think it's it's the data centers themselves holding people back. I think what holds the financial institutions back is that historically you haven't had the right engineering staff to build the models to use the unformatted data. The strength right, right now in banking in that space is in risk management. There are a lot of folks in risk, a lot of quants in risk management who actually have that knowledge of how to build models and go after raw data and create value from it those skills have not transferred themselves into the customer service and, and, and customer intimacy areas in the banks at this time, at least in my opinion. Ken, once banks have collected a lot of customer data and made it usable, how do they approach the customer with it to achieve intimacy without annoying them? You're, you really, your question was actually the key answer. You approach the customer. And what you don't see a lot of now, but you should, is you should see a way to engage the customer in a conversation about how they want to be intimate digitally. Um, so you should be able to log into the website for your bank and say, I would like to receive alerts, for instance, when a direct deposit comes in or when a large debit comes in. Uh, and then you're actually asking them to engage with you and helping define uh, your conversation. The bank's also need to communicate their abilities on this front. And we've seen a couple of really good examples. Uh, there's a couple of credit card companies out there, banks uh, with large credit card portfolios that will advise customers when abnormal transactions come through, you know, a big charge. So if you had just left a restaurant and you saw a $300 charge come through and you had engaged with your bank to say, when something like that happens, it's okay if you text me. And then a text comes through from the bank as you're driving away from the restaurant saying, you just did you just spend $300 at you know, Shea Paul. And if you just click a yes, then the customer really feels like they're served. They feel like the bank was watching out for you. You communicated them with them in a manner in which they approved or, or invited you to. But creating that channel so you can ask the customer, what are the types of things you'd like 
me to communicate with you about and how would you like that communication? Do you want an email? Do you want a text? Or even do you want a phone call? That's the type of engagement that banks need to get much better at. Well, what do you see now? Just sort of a stock uh, offers or stock come-ons at the end of a transaction? There's probably, I mean, it's certainly a, a wide universe and there are banks that are much better at this than others. I would say almost all banks are exceptional at this in terms of combating fraud. I think most banks are exceptional in the use of data in terms of boarding the appropriate customers. In other words, they know your customer process. Um, I think catching, uh, you know, uh, fraudulent, uh, extortive payments, human trafficking. I mean, th these are the things that banks do on behalf of governments around the world that they don't get enough credit for and a money laundering. I mean, the banks are just extraordinary in going through huge amounts of data and, and, and millions and millions of transactions every day uh, to make sure that the bad money doesn't move around the world. I think banks are under-recognized for doing that. So I think they're serving that function well. When you move out into the more um, customer service edge of that and, and really doing something that adds value to you, uh, maybe some patterns you'd be interested in, maybe suggesting an investment that fits your profile, banks are very weak at that. So very good on the security, very good at, at, at intimacy in terms of keeping you safe, not very good at suggesting what might be helpful for you in your overall financial picture. Chris Skinner, who writes extensively about digital banking, has done some columns recently saying that a bunch of banks have been freezing accounts, perhaps to avoid getting caught with regulators uh, hitting them for money laundering. But it, it seemed that their banks are just freezing accounts without telling people. Is that a common problem? Or is that just UK? I wouldn't say it's common. And, and um, it, it, it's more prevalent in countries where you have uh, more of that type of fraud. Um, and, and to be honest, you can't, as a bank, the penalties for missing uh, this type of, uh, of uh, malfeasance are large. And, and if you don't actually build a system, and, and, meaning a, and I say that with a small s because it's technology and people and process, um, to make sure that none of that gets through, uh, you can actually find yourself in harm's way, even up to the point where there's questions about, you know, your charter or your viability. So, so the downside of letting bad guys get through the system um, is really large. Um, I think it is very, it's very rare that you get these false positives, I think, where a true customer in regular business finds himself disrupted. And the banks, I think, react very quickly in terms of engaging that customer, outbound phone calls, outbound fraud departments, catching them same moment, same day, same hour. Um, if you can't get response from the channels the customer has given you to communicate with them, then I think you really do have to think about uh, freezing the account. I'm, I'm familiar with the uh, the article you reference, and, and that's the case. The case is you, you've had some suspicious transactions come through and you've been unable to contact your customer uh, to verify that they are who they said they were or that the transactions are of a good nature. So you've got an experience, lots of experience in banking and lots of experience in technology. How do you expect to apply this to CLS? CLS, um, so we're we're this designated financial market utility and, and you know, we clear trillions every day. So for us, um, uptime and resilience is, is job one. You know, we're the plumbing. We also um, help bring down the cost of international payments. So we're driving a lot of money through the world in, in a standardized way um, with real-time settlement and finality and guarantee of payment at a very, very low price point, you know, ele you know 11 pence per million. So that, that oil that keeps the system running is what we need to invest in. In our case, uh, we have a system called the InfoWall that we put up a couple of years ago. And I've, I've talked a lot about artificial intelligence and, and pattern recognition. This is a very B2B kind of example. But on behalf of our customers, we watch their, their flows every day and all around the world and times of day and what types of currencies they trade in at given times and their liquidity positions in currencies in different countries at periods of time. And what our system does for it is allows our operators to engage. And if they see something even marginally out of pattern, to actually directly contact the bank and say, did you know this is happening or did you know you might need more liquidity in a given currency in a given country? Um, that has been extremely well received. 
uh, by our clients. In other words, they appreciate the fact that we are monitoring the ecosystem and reaching out proactively before something happens, before, if you will, uh, the, the corporate version of an overdraft. Uh, so we avoid those types of things so that we don't have any problems with global international settlement. The result, it's not the only thing we've done, but the result of that during the entire first year of COVID is we had 100% uptime, you know, not 99.99 or something like that, 100%. And that's because hundreds of times we were engaging with our clients proactively when we saw possible disruptions or possible uh, changes in patterns that we wanted to verify. And there were a lot of changes in patterns that took place during this pandemic. Can you talk a little bit about the future from your perch in Austin, Texas? You should have a pretty <laughs> clear view, as good as anybody's, of what the future is going to bring in technology. So, you know, you look at the, I like to think about use cases, you know, so before you try to think of a great technology and say, how do I use this great technology? Let's think about the use cases. So as I mentioned earlier, hardware is expensive or hard, hardware is cheap, people are expensive. Data is growing exponentially. And it's not all valuable data, um, but it is correlated data. So if 50% of the world's data is in the cloud now, I think there's gonna be a Moore's law of data. I think that's gonna be exponentially higher amount in the cloud and exponentially more data because more people are monitoring you, watching what you go from one website to another. And even though you may have to now authorize cookies, the truth is there's just a ton of information that's being compiled about your interactions and your, and your activity. Um, so I actually think there is a huge case for analytics, for quants, um, for artificial intelligence to both better protect and serve customers. Those are the mega trends in my eyes. I think safety and security uh, will continue to jump to the forefront. And, and therefore, I don't actually fear that there'll be massive disruption in the payment structures of the world. Uh, people underestimate how much the current payment structures has provided by the banks as provided by SWIFT, as provided by CLS. They underestimate how much work we do in the background to make sure everything is uh, safe and sound and ticked and tied. And uh, I don't fear a disruptor coming up uh, because someone's got to be watching over this ecosystem and keeping the bad guys out. Uh, and that someone will be the, the, the central banks. It will be the, it'll be the large international banks and it'll be the DFMUs. Um, so I think we have to continue to invest to make it cheaper, faster, more transparent and 100% resilient. And if, that, if we're there, that's something that's gonna be very hard to disrupt. Great, well, thank you very much. Run out of time. Appreciate it, Tom, a pleasure.